Um, so hi, hello, and welcome to the Biodiversity Information Standards TADWIG 2020 conference. So this is symposium number six, you have what in your collection? I'm Kat Chapman, I'm with iDigBio, and I'm based in Gainesville, Florida, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, Deb Paul. She's also in Florida, Tallahassee, and she's with Species File, and Deb, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so we are your moderators for this session, and we'd also like to give a thanks to to Kate and Holly and Niels for technical support and other help and backup. So this session is going to be recorded for later viewing. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us in this session. And thank you to all of the speakers in this session. So our symposium features work reflecting what the biodiversity informatics community rallies around regarding getting collections and specifically data about collections out there and discoverable. So the presentations today will be talking about the standard for describing collections, the process of its development, its use and more. So we'll also through a short talk and discussion session, consider the biggest picture of a communal approach to describing our collections at a global level, building on the outputs of GBIF's recent or open consultation on advancing the catalog of the world's natural history collections. So some info, uh, the chat function has been made available for, uh, for questions, technical questions or conversing with other attendees. Please use this judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. Um, so please take a look at our code of conduct. If you need a refresher, um, I'm gonna paste the link to that in the chat. Okay. So we also have a handy Google doc and I think, yes, Debbie has posted the link to that Google Doc in the chat. Um, this is to help us curate questions. It's a little bit neater, a little more clean than using the chat. So please take advantage of it. Don't be shy. Any questions are welcome. And Debbie or I will help to point your questions to the right person. So please keep your microphones muted while presenters are speaking. We will have a discussion session after the talks. Speakers will have 10 minutes for their talk, followed by another 10 minutes for Q&A and I slash we will be giving speakers a warning at the two minute mark so we can ensure that everyone is on time. So before we begin, I'd uh, like our speakers to kindly introduce themselves um, if they don't mind. So I'll go in the order that they're talking. So Matt, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, thanks Kat. Um, yep, so I'm uh, Matt Woodburn. Um, I'm a data architect at the Natural History Museum in London and um, I'm co-convener of the Tadwig Collection Descriptions Data Standard Task Group um, along with Deadpool, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Thanks Matt. All right, Martin, would you like to introduce yourself please? Hi, I'm uh, Martin Trekels from Massa Botanic Garden in Belgium. I work there in uh, the Biodiversity Informatics Group uh, on uh, the Synthesis Plus project. Thanks, Martin. And next we have Sharon. She you introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Sharon Grant. I'm at the Field Museum Natural History in Chicago. I'm the Information Systems Director in the Technology Department. Um, and working with the folks there, we've been testing out collections descriptions with, with the rest of the chats. Thank you, Sharon. All right, Sharif, introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Sharif Islam. I'm from the Naturalis uh, Biodiversity Center in Leiden, in the Netherlands, and I'm also the data architect for the Disco project, and also part of the Synthesis Plus uh, project uh, and Elvis. Thanks so much. And is Donald Hoburn here to introduce himself? I guess not. Well, he's joining us from Australia, so he might join a little bit later. It's pretty early there. So hopefully he joins us. Okay, so now that we have uh, met our speakers, um, without further ado, our first speaker today is Matt Woodburn, uh, presenting Unity and Variety, Developing a Collection Description Standard by Consensus. So take it away, Matt. Okay, thank you. Let me just get this screen shared appropriately. Hey, great. So, um, yeah, um, good morning slash afternoon slash evening, everybody. Um, as you heard, I'm Matt Woodburn. I co-convene the Tadwig Collection Descriptions uh, Data Standard Task Group along with Deb. And I have the great privilege of kicking off this symposium by talking a bit about the group's work on developing a data standard for collection descriptions. 
Um, firstly, I just want to do a quick introduction to the group. So the task group was set up last year within the collection descriptions interest group, with the remit being to create a new data standard for describing both digitized and undigitized natural science collections, along with a data model um, guidance and reference implementation as to support the application of the standard. So as a group, we've been um, trying out a few new approaches to standard development that I think are worth mentioning, with the, um, the main aim of trying to make it a, a bit more of an in inclusive community uh, driven process than standard developments can be. Um, so as well as uh, doing in-person meetings and workshops back uh, when that used to be a thing we could actually do, we've also been making extensive use of structured issues in GitHub to discuss and work collaboratively on the standard definitions and linking to them from Google Sheets to make the work more accessible and to try and lower the, the technical bar to participation. Um, we've also run a number of informal online barbecues where anyone interested can join via Zoom and work together on various aspects of the standard. And we've been using Wikibase to explore and test the developing standard and data model, which you'll find out more about in the next talk. Um, so these approaches seem to be working quite well. And indeed, some of the other Tadwig task groups have started using some of them as well, which I think is uh, quite a good positive indication of the methods. So as I um, mentioned, there are, there are really two main streams of development within the task group. So the first is the data standard itself. So that's the bag of terms um, made up of a set of defined classes and properties. We're reusing terms from existing standards wherever possible, uh, defining new terms where necessary, and also trying to find existing control vocabularies that could be used for those terms where appropriate. But we're also working on a data model or ontology to support the use of the standard. And this includes not only defining how the classes relate to each other, um, but also looking at how variants in the model might be used for different use cases, um, how numeric metrics can be used, how different collection descriptions can be linked together in a kind of relationship model, and how those can be then linked to digital specimen records. And that's where we get into some of the really tricky areas um, uh, uh, in the modeling, because there's a number of aspects of collection descriptions data modeling that can really be a massive headache. Um, for one thing, collections are dynamic. They often change over time, um, whether that's due to acquisitions or loans or disposals or being split up or merged together. And that's quite a different challenge to tracking a single object moving around. They also overlap. So a paleontology collection might contain a Darwin fossils collection, which might also be part of a wider Darwin collection across multiple institutions. And so there's, there's dangers of doing things like counting objects multiple times. We're also commonly dealing with various levels of uncertainty in collection descriptions, as when describing a collection, we quite often don't know exactly what's in it or how many of them there are. And that makes it difficult to both manage and generate the data. And finally, the whole concept of a collection is really heavily contextual. It depends very much on the purpose for which you're describing it. And we may want to break the same collection down in multiple ways for different purposes. So to, to illustrate um, one of these core challenges, I think it's useful to refer to a highly simplified data model for a, a single specimen or collection object, such as you might have in a Darwin core record, for example. So the entity which represents that specimen generally has various attributes um, attached that describe it, such as the geographic origin or the taxon or preparation type. In most cases, that specimen will generally have a one-to-one -one relationship with those attributes. It was collected from one geographic location, it represents one taxon, it has one preparation type. When you're dealing with collection descriptions, however, that core entity doesn't represent a single tangible physical object. Instead, it represents a group of objects, a class which we're currently calling with huge imagination, an object group. And although an object group will have many of the same attributes as a single specimen, the objects that it represents may be very heterogeneous. Um, they could potentially come from many geographic locations, represent multiple taxa, or be of a range of preparation types. So there can be a one-to-many relationship between the object group and many of its attributes. Um, in addition to this, there are metrics to add into this model. So those are the, the numeric attributes um, which we need to quantify the contents of the object group, such as the number of objects or the number of taxa represented. These are the denominators. So the numbers that allow us to say that, for example, rather than just we've digitized 10,000 specimens from our collection, we can say that we've digitized 10,000 out of 50,000. So that's 20% done and there's 40,000 specimens to go. But you can also optionally um, use one or more of those attributes to break down the collection objects that you're trying to describe into more smaller object groups. 
you're effectively enforcing a one-to-one -one relationship between the object group and that attribute, in this example, a taxon. Within the CD model, we're calling an attribute used in that way a dimension, and this provides a more systematic way of breaking down and describing the collections in smaller chunks, but with more detailed metrics and descriptions. And finally, you might also want to be able to maintain those collection descriptions at both levels of granularity and link between object groups using parent-child or other semantic relationships. But there are practical limits to how many attributes you can use as dimensions and how many object groups you can break everything down to before things become completely unmanageable. And from exploring the dimensional approach, we realized that although it was very powerful for quantitative collection description schemes, um, such as for dynamic collections dashboards, um, it didn't map very well to use cases which required less investment of time and resources and a simpler, more manageable and more flexible data set. And so there's another option for dealing with these. Um, rather than breaking down an object group into smaller chunks, you can add metrics to the relationships between the object group and the attributes. This gives some more detailed numbers on what specimens of different characteristics are in the object group and the metrics attached to the object object group itself still act as that overall denominator. So this is quite simple and flexible, but there are calculations using the metrics that are possible using the dimensional approach, but that you can't do with this variant of the model. So I think the real take home message is that at the moment, there isn't really a one, one size fits all solution to the modeling problem, but we can look at combinations of these different approaches and try and map them to the main collection description use cases. We're in the process of investigating the various options and assessing them based on the amount of effort required to create and manage collection descriptions using them and working out for each what is and what isn't possible to do in terms of calculations based on the metrics. So basically a set of pros and cons, benefits and advantages and uh, disadvantages for each option. And the ultimate aim from this is to be able to produce some straightforward guidance on appropriate ways to model your collection descriptions, depending on what you're able to put in and what you want to get out of the data. Part of that is to then explore how it might be possible to chain that to a kind of workflow where it's possible to start really simple and then build up the detail and the utility of the data set over the course of time. So beyond the conceptual side of things, what are we doing to start bringing the CD work into the real world and dealing with this range of applications? Well, there's been um, some work on various proofs of concept, which includes trying out the standard and data model options in Wikibase, which uh, Martin Treckles and Sharon Grant will both talk about in the next couple of presentations. But also under the synthesis program, there's been a pilot collections digitization dashboard created under the leadership of CTAF in which we've used the draft CD standard and a dimensional model for the underlying data set. Two minutes, Matt. Thank you. Um, we're looking at also greater collaboration with the other data standards, both those existing like Darwin Core and ABCD, so that we're not reinventing the wheel unnecessarily. And uh, also developments like the Open Digital Specimen, OpenDS um, specification and MIDS or minimum information for a digital specimen. Um, and there's also any relevant work to tap into going on in the Tadwig attribution group around people. And then there's some more specific initiatives within the community that we need to make sure the CD work will support effectively and explore in more detail how it will meet their needs. Um, as well as the plans of organizations like DISCO and GBIF and CTAF, um, we have the outcomes of the global consultation on advancing the catalogue of the world's collections to absorb, which you'll hear uh, Donald Hoban hopefully talk about more later in the symposium. Um, we also need to start looking at the practical elements of how the CD standard might be adopted by tools such as the Integrated Publishing Toolkit, uh, IPT, and the Biogage Provider Software, which will also be the subject of an upcoming uh, GBIF consultation, I believe. And finally, another important consideration is to how CDs might be better supported by institutional collection management systems. So there's a fair bit to do there, but in terms of the next priorities, I think the clear message that we got from the task group working session last month um, was that the number one priority is to get a first draft of the standard terms and definitions done and ready for wider community review. So that will be the main focus of the next few months. Progresses have been a little bit slower than we'd hoped for overall, but we'd like to get in that, into that position early in 2021. And secondary to that is continuing to work on the data modeling and documentation and continuing to try things out along the way using Wikibase and other work examples. And this is the point in the presentation where we tend to try and do a little fishing. Um, we've got 
quite a lot to get through. We've got some really tricky puzzles to solve and we're always up for more help if we can get it. So that might be helping to finish off the standard definitions, to review the current definitions. Um, and in particular, we'd love people with a good knowledge of other relevant standards and control vocabularies to help us incorporate them into the CD standard. Um, we'd also encourage anyone interested in trying out Wikibase and putting some of their collection descriptions data into it to have a crack at that. And if you have um, experience in solving complex uh, data modeling conundrums and reckon you could put some brain time into that, then we'd also very much like to hear from you. All right, that's time, Matt. Perfect. Um, so I'll just say a huge thanks to actually to all the people that have uh, done all the work so far and to those um, running this conference and running this session. Um, and here are some details. Um, thank you very much for listening. All right, excellent talk. Thank you so much, Matt. And uh, it's time for questions. If anybody has any questions, I'm looking in the Google document and don't be shy. If there's questions, just put them in there or you can put them in the chat. But I don't see any questions. I think their brains are working hard. Yeah. So I'm, I have one. Oh, I can let somebody in there. Oh, but my connection is wonky. Hopefully you can still hear me. I can um, hear you. Yay. So moving forward, I wanted to let the community know, um, and some of you have been involved in this process before. So when these standards, when we get done with the first draft, which should be soon, um, we need the community to review it. So for example, we have a bag of terms, like many of you are already familiar with for Darwin Core. So if we put out a bag of terms and we would like you to look at the definitions and the controlled vocabularies, um, do y'all have any thoughts for uh, who wants to raise their hand for that or how should we approach people so that we can get uh, an engaged process there? Anybody have any thoughts? Spinach, for example, would be a, a great community to help us look at these things. Barb, I see you on my screen, so any thoughts? Raise your hand if you want to weigh in or you can type in the chat. So again, looking at, at ideas you all have for how to get people involved in doing this review would be very helpful. Hackathons, okay. We could have like a barbecue and invite people. There's another question I see, Kat, right? From Matt, do you see the question from Ellie? Oh, yes. Um, okay, so I had a question um, that it's very common for large old collections not to know how many things are actually in the collection. Is this a deal breaker? Very much not, because this standard would not work if it depended on everybody having a completely accurate assessment of what's in their collections. Um, and I think that is one of the main things that we have to deal with is also levels of precision, uncertainty in estimating what's in the collections and then in refining the estimates as you kind of interact with the collections over time. Um, but also I think some being able to manage that quite precise data that you might have from the digitized portion of a collection and being able to combine that with the less precise data that you have for the undigitized proportion so you still get the overall picture. So definitely not a deal breaker, but one of the trickier things to deal with. All right, and I see Paula has her hand up. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I was thinking about the question that Deb asked before about how to involve the community. And I find that if you put a, something to the community for review that is too big, they will kind of get timid about it and you will not get much feedback. So I was wondering if instead of putting the whole the standard for, for, for review for, for the people to comment on at least as, as a first step, there could be chunks of it that people can get engaged in. Thanks for that. I, I think that's an, an excellent observation, Paula. Yeah, so I think we can start thinking <clears throat> about the best ways to chunk that up. Um, whether it might be on a class-by-class -class basis or whether you take a number of classes that are related. 
I definitely food for thought. Thank you. All right, it looks like we've got a couple of questions in the chat. And uh, so we can take these questions from, from Josh and from Yorit, and then we can move on to the next talk. So Josh is asking, has there been any consideration of how object groups are defined? Presumably the default would be to define them in a textual way, more like a label, Darwin specimens or botany specimens, for example, but is there scope to define them using, for example, structured queries? Um, yes. So uh, I think um, much of the previous um, uh, methods of describing collections has tended to be through textual labels. And I think that's been part of the issue um, with it because they're not using common vocabularies and common standards. And I think what we want to move towards is in addition to having that rich text narrative um, data to be able to attach those to particular collections to also be able to define them using quite um, defined terms and control vocabularies as well so that you can use structured queries to query both within them but also across them and so that's a key part of the data model. Thanks and finally Yorit is asking are you planning to provide tools to translate existing collection data to your proposed format slash model? Um, I'd say that there's not plans for building specific tools within the group at the moment. Um, I think we do need to, um, certainly for any um, collections that have been described in previous um, uh, standards, so like the old NCD standard, um, unratified standard from Tadwig, or um, within ABCD or, or Darwin Core. Um, so far to be able to translate that into our standard. I think at the moment within the, the scope of the group is not, is not building tools for translating things, but you can certainly, I think, look at mappings between um, other collections data sets and how they can, can help people um, uh, translate them into the new standard. Thanks. And we do have a question from Lauren. I wanna stay on time. All right, we're getting more questions. So if you can answer Lauren's question quickly so we can move on. Uh, we will have discussion at the end of our talk so we can talk about these things in more detail. Um, but Lauren is asking, can object groups be nested or hierarchical or is that all recorded in the relationships between them? And then after this question, we need to move on. Um, I think the, the quick answer to that is um, we're looking at options for it at the moment. Um, we know there's, there's a need to be able to build hierarchical um, uh, relationships between them, but I think a more flexible relationship model would probably be um, our first protocol at the moment that would allow hierarchies and other kind of relationships to be maintained. But as I say, early days on that. But. Okay, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for the questions. Again, uh, we will have time after the talks, so we can talk about these things in more detail. So next up, we have Martin Treckles uh, with his talk entitled, How do you develop a data standard? Wikibase might be the solution. So the floor is yours, Martin, take it away. Hi. Uh, everyone, uh, I'm gonna apologize in the beginning for if this presentation doesn't uh, go that smooth as planned because I'm lacking a lot of sleep in the last couple of days since some new life entered my world. Um, but I will anyway try. Uh, first of all, uh, what is a Wikibase? So Wikibase, uh, it says in the name, it's a wiki, it's part of the Wikimedia Foundation. And so like you have the Wikipedia, Wikidata, Wiktionary, and all these other brands of uh, the Wikimedia Foundation. Although in, in this figure, you see that Wikibase uh, is not present. Why is that? Wikibase is actually the uh, software which is under the hood of Wikidata. So, what exactly is a Wikibase? It is an uh, extension to the MediaWiki uh, software that lets you store and manage some of your data in a uh, collaboratively way. It's mostly used uh, by Wikidata, the free uh, knowledge graph, um, but the Wikibase has the big advantage that you don't have to go 
to um, this wiki data, which is very, very strict on defining properties and describing your data. This wiki base is completely up to you and you can modify and add properties as you like. This makes it a very versatile tool because you're not bound to uh, the big wiki community. It's something you are running on your own uh, uh, separate entity. In this project, I created a wiki base and this uh, wiki base is actually running on something very recent by uh, the uh, wiki media foundation and that's the WB stack. Uh, this is a, a, a platform that allows you to run several wiki bases on a central infrastructure that uh, where you don't have to take care of uh, the wiki base themselves. So you can still install a wiki base on your own, on your server, but then you have to do the maintenance yourself. Uh, but on this, uh, on this central infrastructure, um, which is developed by uh, Adam Shore. Uh, it's um, actually the, the, the foundation that is guaranteeing you uh, that the wiki bases are, are running. And you can, like you see here in this figure, you can run several wikis uh, at the same time. All of them are uh, having different kind of properties are structured differently, but you can add as many as you like. Well, it's still in, the, in a very early stage, so not as many as you want, but you can create several. How does Wikidata and, in, uh, uh, and does a Wikibase work? Actually, this is my own record in, 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 in Wikidata. And typically you have something which is an item with a queue number that has a property and uh, that property has a value. So this is, uh, it, all the data is stored in triples where you uh, have typically always an item with a queue number that has some uh, properties. And then the values themselves, they can vary. That can be strings, that can be other items, uh, that can be dates. Uh, you, can, you can define them yourself. And this is also how uh, the wiki base uh, will uh, use. So in the past, uh, uh, couple of months slash years, there is a lot of work done on developing this collection description uh, standard. We, there is, it's already in quite a good shape, but are we able to use that standard? And to do that, we have to have a tool that um, makes it easy to uh, test the current uh, design of the standard. Um, and there are a few things that might be beneficial to that. Uh, you want to actually enter some data manually, as well as doing some mass import. You don't want to be uh, in, at the start bound to a specific data model. You want to explore a few things uh, that you want. And you want to see whether you can get information out of your, uh, of your, of your uh, model or slash uh, standard. And there you can use the Sparkle uh, query endpoint of the Wikibase where you can see if you can get the correct metrics um, uh, out. Another thing and a very important thing that you want to test this uh, uh, standard is that you do also want to involve non-technical users. So not everyone is familiar with databases or storing data or modeling their data. So you need something uh, that other people that are not uh, knowledgeable about uh, or don't have a, a great IT skills to put their data in. And the wiki base is very um, uh, easy in this way that it has a very good uh, graphical user interface. Uh, for the ones that already uh, used Wikidata, they know, but it, it's really just typing in fields, um, which is not so difficult. And so, uh, all the key persons that might be involved in describing collections that are not really uh, uh, very uh, technical can add their data in, in the Wikibase. So we created this uh, collection description Wikibase for which you see here the, the URL. And this Wikibase contains all the properties that are defined uh, so far in the standard. We have 
in on the main page a few examples of uh, uh, trials of collections or describing collections that we did and also some examples of sparkle queries to get the numbers out of uh, of your data so basically um, you have all the properties to describe your collection. The only thing what's missing now, or to a large extent missing now in this wiki base, is the collections themselves. So you, we, we really would like to encourage people to add their data in there. To give an example, this is uh, the Natural History Museum in London. Like you, I said, it has some queue number with some properties attached. These properties are not the typical wiki data uh, properties, but uh, the, uh, the properties defined in the collection description standard. Uh, a good, a big advantage as well is that we can use this, uh, this uh, wiki base or the wiki base way of working to also implement the controlled vocabularies. So if we define the controlled vocabularies in a specific way, we can actually see which terms people are using or need to use to uh, uh, to have uh, to co to to um, display their their data, and uh, we can also add properties uh, if you need them. So suppose that you have uh, you see in the whole collection description uh, standard something missing a property which is not yet uh, defined in our uh, in the standard so far you can add an extra properties um, to uh, to this two minutes okay thank you uh, moreover you are not bound to any data model so you can in this statement sections make statements about your collection uh, as you wish so you you don't have to follow uh, the way that the examples are at the moment inside the wiki base. You can have a bit of freedom in, in how you want to define your collection. And it's actually, we really, uh, um, in the uh, next couple of months, what would be really nice is please add your collection data in there. Try out the wiki base. Uh, we need ex examples how you want to uh, represent your data. Um, and we really want people to make mistakes. Don't uh, be uh, afraid of making mistakes into this wiki base. You actually cannot make any mistakes because if you, for some reason, would mess up uh, the whole wiki base, we can always revert to a, a previous version. We have, uh, uh, or at least I have that uh, possibility. Uh, so just go in there, add your data, uh, try it out, uh, make mistakes, mess up data. And with all of these mistakes, we definitely can learn something about the standard. Where are the limits of what we can do? Are there some properties missing? Are there properties that will be never used? And then in a later stage, after this manual effort, uh, we would like to do some mass uh, import of existing data uh, when the model is a bit more settled and see whether we can extract all the, the relevant uh, metrics. But really, the message I want to give here now is please go into that wiki base, uh, request an account, because you still need to request an account to do that, uh, and start adding your data. And with that, I really want to thank you for listening to All right. Thanks so much, Martin. And you're on time. I, I was getting ready to, to give you your warning, but now you finished right on time. So um, great. Thank you. And echoing what the chat has said, congratulations. I am everyone else. We're really happy for you. That's really cool. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, it's uh, time for questions. And so we have a couple of questions. Um, first one from Siobhan, uh, thinking about the future. Once the model is agreed upon, would you consider pushing some or all of it out to Wikidata proper as well? So there are a few uh, few things. So um, that might be a possibility. So I know that they are also working on some kind of federation between Wikibases and Wikidata. But in Wikidata, you have to be very aware that the the set of properties in there are very, very fixed. And if you want to add properties or change properties inside Wikidata, you have to go to a whole community um, 
discussion on what you exactly want. And this is often a very difficult discussion. That's why we use this wiki base where we have the freedom to do whatever we like with our properties view. But there is definitely, uh, we can provide input to this discussion in Wikidata on, uh, on uh, adding properties in there. All right, thanks. And another question from David. Are you planning to use the Cradle tool to make the input for non-technical users even easier? So far, I didn't uh, consider it yet, but uh, it's definitely something I, I could look into it. Thanks. All right, we have a question from Guido. Uh, if people can freely add properties as they see fit, how to consolidate them later, how to handle potential near duplications? Well, in this, this initial stage, we will not care too much about these. So what, in this initial stage, we really would like to see um, some very, very basic things that are missing because all of the people that are working hard to define the properties that are needed to describe a collection, they have developed a certain image on how this looks like. Um, and we might have missed something or we might have missed a property that is crucial to, um, to many of, uh, of you. So already those kind of things uh, are very interesting. Also, maybe the, the, the way that the, the, the standard is presented right now is just too complex to, to handle. Uh, and already that kind of input is interesting. Um, so in this very initial stage, we really would rather like to have some, um, some very, very general remarks about the standard. And then later on, when the model is a bit more fixed, we could think of having uh, of mass importing or importing uh, according to specific schemes. And we can do, for example, uh, entity schemas uh, where we actually impose a certain uh, model to the, to the data. But for now, this is not yet the case. And I would really rather like to start the discussion on the standard itself. And um, so if you consider doing this, um, it's, um, you could come in contact with me and we can discuss a bit uh, further or just go ahead and go in there and, and, and add your data. Thanks. All right, we've got one question, one more from Bram. Uh, how about data integrity, duplication, safety, et cetera? Um, in, well, um, so, to be, to be very, really, maybe I didn't stress that uh, enough, but this wiki base is just a playground for us. So there is no way that this will be used uh, to disseminate um, any information on collections. So it's not meant to be uh, the portal where you go to find information on collections. It's just a playground and the field museum in the next talk will, will show how they played around with it. Uh, it's just a playground to, to, to uh, um, to try out stuff uh, about safety. So basically you still need to request an account on this uh, wiki base and I need to approve you. So if I don't know uh, you or if you don't contact me, I just don't let you in and you cannot change anything. All right, oh, we've got one more from William. Uh, given this is a test implementation, is it worth it to do bulk uploads now? Uh, what could be interesting is, uh, for example, take one of the potential data models uh, and have some kind of set of data which is uh, following one of the models and see what we can do with it. Uh, that's definitely some possibility that we can explore. All right, thanks. And unless anyone else has any more questions, we are right on time to move on to our next talk. So next we have Sharon Grant um, with her talk entitled, Reducing the Pain of Getting Your Backlog Published. So take it away, Sharon. Thanks, Kat. I'm just gonna do the screen share thing. Hope this all works out. Does that look good on your end? Hopefully. Okay, so, um, Thanks for joining us, everyone. My job today is to give you an overview of the process of uh, getting a set of collections descriptions into um, the draft standard um, using the, the wiki base that Martin has just talked about. 
So I'm just going to do a brief re recap because people have been coming in as we've been talking. So a little bit of the history of this. Uh, the first attempt at creating a collection of descriptions to Gantt standard was in 2008. Um, it was used in a few implementations, but it was never actually ratified and uh, pretty much sat dormant until 2017 when Deb and um, a bunch of other people decided to re reinvigorate the task group. So the, the group was motivated by the same kind of questions as in 2008. Basically, everyone wants to know what you have. They want to know how much you have. And then on top of that is layered this mad dash uh, to, to do everything quickly. So it's the same sort of underlying issues. However, this time, there's actually a much more focused uh, need to decrease the amount of labor that goes into creating. Um, these summaries. And also everybody wants a dashboard and they want a visualization system and they want the metrics in an automated fashion. So thankfully this is the shifted um, the focus back to this standard, but also shifted it into a, a, a more uh, automated fashion. We're also a little less uh, focused on, you know, just the plain size of things, which is good. So rather than reinventing the wheels, the aims of this group um, has been to reuse existing terms with their definitions as much as possible. And that's so as to build on the existing knowledge that data providers and users already have of the domain and thereby flatten the learning curve a touch. Um, and by doing that, we're hoping that the speed of backlog mobilization and illumination of dark data can, can go up. So two, two lessons that we took from previous standards development processes were that the looser the standard, the more likely it is to be used, but at the same time, the scope for standards abuse is much higher. Uh, on the flip side, if the standard is too rigid, it looks great in the abstract on paper, but it rarely gains adoption at the scale needed for mass mobilization. So we were very much trying to find um, a happy medium somewhere. So the first order of business um, when we were trying to implement the standard as we have it right now, is that we had to think very hard about how we wanted to describe our data. And so at the initial point of data entry, you really want to focus on how granular the descriptions are going to get. Um, and that largely depends on the amount of information that you have readily to hand and the amount of time that you're going to have to parse it. So because um, the bigger the collection, the more information you have, maybe. So as the collections descriptions become more granular, the problem there is that they start to overlap at the occurrence level. So eventually you run the risk of starting to detail occurrences. And there is actually already a standard for that. So we don't want to go down that path. So in attempting this exercise for the Field Museum, we ended up with a four level schema with the Field Museum at the top as an institution down through its departments, collections. And then for us, we were able to go down to already digitized accession records. So we could go quite a long way down. Once we'd done that, the next step was to match the data fields that we had available to us, mainly through our collections management system, to the standard terms that were being documented as issues in the collection description GitHub repo that Matt mentioned earlier. So, those were the descriptive terms, but allied to those were the linking fields that were needed, that are needed and gonna be very important to handle the underlying relationships because as we've pointed out, they are both hierarchical and lateral. So just stepping back a little bit, it's very easy to conceptualize the relationships between collections levels as a diagram. It actually becomes much more tricky to formalize them as data structures, which is, where we were with Matt's presentation. So this table, which I won't leave up for very long, but it lays out um, the relationships between effort and granularity of collections levels as it relates to the types of metrics that can be automatically created from the underlying data structures that represent them. And what you'll see is that the more detailed the metric, the more effort. So this, is, this diagram shows the high level collections description and how it might look for the field museum. So at its simplest, it's a single object group that has a number of dimensions and properties. And some of those have metrics associated with them. And this 
I, we felt was probably the level that was most analogous to data sets such as index for bearing one and GR cycle. But we know from our initial diagram, however, that the field museum can split easily into a second and third level. So each department and collection within a department, therefore, can be its own object group with dimensions, properties, and metrics. And this is what the fossil invertebrate collection looks like as it relates to its parent geology department. And just to show that the standard works just as well for non-natural history collections, this is the anthropology uh, department collections. So the third step in the process was to see how easily the standard terms could be transformed, uh, transferred to a data platform. Now, as you've heard, Wikibase was selected um, primarily because of the expertise we had already in the department, uh, in the group with Martin and, and Quentin and some others. And as you've heard, the aim here was not to a priori impose a data structure on those of us who were gonna be entering data, but to see what naturally developed um, from separate attempts to document the collections. Um, and we ended up with three different institutions, namely MESA, NHM London, and us at the Field Museum. So to be honest, most of our teething problems at the Field Museum with the platform centered around the fact that we'd actually never used it before. Um, and we had to navigate terminology and then align the concepts between the standard and Wikibase's native terminology. And you saw that a little with Martin's presentation. So for example, the standard uses dimensions and classes, whilst Wikibase's uses items and properties and values. And they're similar, but they're not identical in the way that they, they are used. So once we actually got our heads around that, which did take a little while, um, we actually started to, to really identify um, some issues with the standard terms. There were duplicates and actually there were some things that were just missing. So for those of you familiar with Wikibase and from the presentation earlier, you'll recognize the interface here. For those of you that aren't, this is what the Field Museum Institution record looks like once data has been entered. And this is the zoology collection. So we got two levels down. Um, the other thing that Martin had set up for us was a bunch of uh, uh, sparkle graphing and summary queries. And what those very quickly highlight, highlighted for us was that actually all three of us were entering our data differently. So exactly what people have been mentioning um, is what was starting to happen. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing because as we refined and thought more about it, they actually started to come back around together. So if you graph it out, this is what the first two levels of the Field Museum um, data looks like. So you can do it, you can represent the data in Wikibase. Um, and this is a cut, these are the properties, the close up of the, um, the query that generates them. If we burrow down a little further into the zoology collection record, we can see that we can use the, the platform to assign um, uh, properties to the next level down. And this is a query that um, allows you to pull out metrics because that's the other point of the whole um, effort. So here you can see the zoology collections and these are counts that we managed to pull out at the object quantity level and the taxon level. So we've, we've shown that you can actually use the standard fields if you put them together right to, to calculate metrics. Two minutes. Thank you. So what we learned um, from the implementation, the takeaways for us were that the ability of the standard to allow strict documentation of the relationships between collection descriptions at different levels is gonna be critical to the ability of a platform to calculate metrics in an automated and reproducible way. Platform choice at the beginning is gonna be critical, especially at data entry level because that can actually create severe data entry barriers. So this is gonna to have, to, these are gonna to have to be very carefully selected and as far as possible, agnostic of end use um, to, to make things simple. We're also gonna to have to obviously have detailed term definitions and controlled vocabularies, um, as well as a common base level data structure. I think that is gonna be imperative because without these interoperab interoperability at the aggregator level is gonna be impossible. So to finish up, I want to take a moment to share some lessons that we learned from the standards process itself. So it takes time to understand not only the problem 
also to reach agreements and compromises that don't affect the usefulness of the standard. Um, there is always too much to do in one go. The longer you take, the more likely it is that the goalpost will move while you're doing it, and you'll have to start again. Bending the standard to fit the end use um, just for the sake of pleasing everybody can actually reduce the rate of uptake of a standard. And it's best to concentrate first on the core. So I would um, encourage everybody to remember each other in the process, um, imposing, increasing someone, the workload on another area in the process doesn't, isn't gonna help. Um, standards are supposed to make it easier for everyone, not just for the individual provider or user. So thank you to the team. Thank you to Dave Bloom for getting this, um, getting us started on this at the Field Museum. Nice. Thank you, Sharon. Right on time. So does anybody have any questions? It is time for questions. And don't be shy. I know your brains are percolating. My gears are turning. So don't be shy. Ask away. Stunned silence. Because your talk was just that good. You answered everybody's <laughs> questions preemptively. There we go. All right, here's a question from Debbie. I mean, Debbie, you can just speak up if you have a question. Um, what advice can you offer for those that want to try? To get their stuff in the Wikibase. Yeah, just uh, first up, email Martin and um, get in touch and we'll help you through. We actually had an hour, hour and a half tutorial before they let us loose um, in there. And it's a computer, so it's not really breakable, but it would be great to actually have some more um, examples. And now that there are, there's data in there to, to work with and see, it, it's a lot less painful. We were starting from a very, very empty box. Thanks. All right, we have a question from David Bloom. How might another collection or institution use your template and structure? So um, most of our documents are shared up on the, um, the GitHub repo. Um, and the, the key is to, to draw your own diagram first. That was really where we had to start. You kind of know it innately and conceptually because you spend a lot of time in your institution. So the first thing is just to sit with a, a notepad or with electronic notepad and draw out the relationships because that will show you which fields you, you're going to need to pick um, from the, the issues list. Hopefully that helps. And you can ask, we'll help you. Thanks. All right, Quentin is asking, how much is this a top-down policy driven initiative? In terms of who was asking us to do it at the Field Museum, Quentin? How much are they asking for the metrics of these data to get key performance indicators and things like that? That really, that really was the driver in 2017, as far as I, you know, when I was first brought into the, the working group, we had had a number of very big, high level institutional requests. And they'd also come from other institutions and groups of institutions. Um, so it was definitely increasing and I know I'm sure every museum out there has had these requests. So yeah, it's kind of coming from the top um, and increasing. So we have to do it more efficiently to save our collection managers. Thanks. Any more questions? All right, we have one from Paula. How can a non-English speaking collection approach it? In this case, understanding documentation can be very challenging, or rather, who would be interested in translating this great material? That's a great question, Paula. Anyone who wants to put their hand up, my Spanish is very basic. Um, and I can only do French if French people help me. So it would, it would actually be great because we've actually got a lot of really good documentation in the, uh, the GitHub issues list on discussions around how a term was developed and why it's going to be used. And we've, we've tried really hard to 
to start the process of control vocabulary so they can go out with the, uh, the standard rather than waiting to play catch up with those. So it would be really very helpful to have those when it goes out to the community. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, I, I agree. Yeah, the more languages and the more accessibility, the better. All right, any more questions? I can do it in, in, in interpretive dance. Yes, Paola. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, um, we have our I, dance party social on Friday, so you can do the interpretive dance then. Sorry, Debbie, I cut you off. No, it's okay. I just thought of one more question. Um, Sharon, one of the things that we did uh, get asked by you and the, the Field Museum group and others, but you brought it up, was the need to make sure the standard will serve um, things like archaeological or zooarchaeological zo collections data. Can you, um, what was the demand for that or who was, who was asking for that? Um, yeah, that, that's come through from a number of different um, avenues. There's obviously the, the ZooArcNet folks who've done an awful lot of work in that um, direction. Our overriding reason for that, the Field Museum though, is that we're, we're one of the few relatively big museums that has collections from across um, the gamut, from humans through the animal and the plants and then into deep geological time. So it's really important for us not to do this twice because we are getting requests for similar information from the cultural um, groups and people on that side of the fence. And we, we absolutely can't do this twice in two different ways. And having worked through this process a little bit, whilst we call things dif different names, the concepts are the same. So yeah, we're, we're, we're getting requests from senior people on both sides of the camp. Thanks for that. All right, any more? Great questions so far. And if no one else has any burning questions right now, we can move on. I'll give you guys a few more seconds. All right, so thank you again for the great talk. So next we have Sharif Islam with uh, his talk titled European Loans and Visit System, Elvis, as a use case for a collection description standard. So take it away, Sharif. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, so I'll be talking about uh, European loans and uh, visit system today. Uh, this is currently a tool we are developing in the Synthesis Plus project. And I'll be talking about the details of those projects in a minute. Uh, but before that, I want to share a uh, user story. Um, this is, uh, we collected uh, from a survey for the Disco project. Uh, user stories are great tools for um, software development because they allow us to collect uh, different scenarios, different persona, and uh, focus on specific things. So you can target your development effort. Here, uh, as a collection manager, I want to start a digitization project so that, that I can digitize a certain group of my collection. I like to do this internationally because of funding. For this, I need to know which other institute hold collections of this group. And here you can see the need for standardized items because not only I need to find out what's in my collection, what's in my group, I need to map that to the same group in another institutions or more than one institution. So that's where the standard will help us to figure out that we're talking about the same thing in different contexts. So uh, how Elvis will help uh, us. Uh, so Elvis currently is a project in the Synthesis Plus, which is a European project. So even though it's a European project, we're planning to release Elvis as an open source tool in the future. And of course, the data coming out of these projects will be uh, open uh, for researchers all over the world. And hopefully, uh, we'll have uh, people outside of Europe using uh, this system as well. And after synthesis, Elvis will become a service uh, for the DISCO uh, research infrastructure, which is currently in the preparation phase. So the idea is Elvis will be a one-stop shop for researchers to provide access to millions of specimens and when we talk about access, uh, we're not just talking about data portal or web page. We're particularly interested in workflows, specifically to facilitate the placement, assessment, 
prioritization and monitoring of requests, uh, visits, loans, and digitization. And you can think of a workflow. Uh, this is an example for a loan request. So I'm interested in an item in a collection. So I identified item from the collection object and I review the policy, uh, ask questions that might be routed to an expert uh, within the institute or outside the institute. And then I request a loan. And then the institution uh, request handler comes in and approves those requests and the items get sent out. So it goes back. Uh, and then we want to capture all this uh, events and data uh, so you can create reports or send it to other systems. And here you can see we identified three different roles and they are all dealing with collections data in a different way. The requester is interested for a research, so looking up the collections and the institution experts, the request under hand handling the request attached to that, that collection. So they all need the description and collection item coming from a catalog. So Elvis is a sort of envisioned as a service. At the moment, we have only small components that we're thinking about, but when we have this whole picture, it will be part of a, a ecosystem in the DISCO project. And the idea is it will interact with the other components, the collection, uh, the collection catalog, authorization and authentication system, uh, digitization on demand. Uh, we're envisioning different dashboards, uh, help desk uh, tied to that. And of course, uh, there should be a value-added service uh, tracking publications coming out of research and visits and loans. And of course, uh, this is not happy, happening in a vacuum. We already have different ways of collecting this data, especially specifically in spreadsheets and emails and other databases for local system loan management and collection management. So we're thinking about either uh, the organization or the institution will, will migrate to Elvis or will figure out a way through APIs and connection, uh, use the current data uh, to get take advantage of the value added service we provide uh, in Elvis. So that it has to be in a both way, a top down and, and bottom, bottom up approach. And then the data landscape, as you can imagine, uh, we're looking into various different things that needs to either we need to consolidate, combine, filter, coming from different aggregators. Uh, and of course, there are uh, the data. We're also looking, looking into both biodiversity and geodiversity data. And there are current data from the synthesis project that are already in place in different formats. And of course, uh, beyond specimens and collections, we have organizations, people, and uh, institutions that, that we need to connect. Uh, one of the components we worked on uh, was the virtual access. Again, the idea here is to remove the reliance on physical access and tie in that with the digitization on demand service model. And in this portal that we uh, developed uh, since uh, February 2020, it's been online, where basically uh, people got together and submitted proposals uh, through this tool, and then the proposal was reviewed and uh, you can see the result in the synthesis uh, web page. And if you look at these uh, proposal, they're all imaging projects, but you can see the commonality that they're, they're all looking at certain collections, either in one institution or more than one uh, institution. And there were collaborators from this institution coming in together. So multiple data points, multiple actors uh, looking at the collection data. So let's go back to the user story that we started with. So there are a few simple things that we can already identify uh, from the standard that we can we can figure out. So as a collection manager, that's the role uh, in the uh, in the Elvis system. So we need to identify the person. Then there will be a project uh, uh, either that will probably come from a funding agency or local institutions. So it'll be ideal if we can use identifier for those two and the policy that we can point to. So that's beyond the collection description, but it will be part of Elvis. And of course, then comes the harder part to defining the, the collection. And of course, the previous talks mentioned already about different levels and hierarchies. So we're also looking into that different way of classifying things. And because the workflow is tied with the digitization, we're interested in, into the classification, also the levels of digitization, and is it digitized or not? And this is where uh, MIDS will come in, the minimum information about a digital specimen. Uh, so all these elements should be searchable and findable for the user to understand what's the status of the uh, collection that You've muted yourself. Oh, okay. Um, and then uh, because of the collaboration and funding agency, there will be also links to those things and calls that we need to tie in. 
And of course, when we're looking into collections from multiple institutions, similar way the classification is to make sense uh, for more than one institutions as well. So this is how the user story is helping us to identify the requirements and, and looking into different uh, properties. Here's a screenshot from the current uh, portal that we're using in Elvis. Uh, at the moment, only one of the component, the virtual access is, is working. We don't have the collections data yet. Uh, here you can see we're using the grid identifier uh, to identify the institutions. And that's one of the things uh, to standardize for us in the Elvis model. Here's a quick example of some mapping we're thinking about. Of course, uh, as you all know, uh, acronyms, we use that a lot for institutions and collections. Uh, we don't want to get rid of them, uh, but uh, we want to tie that with the institution, institution ID, either grid or raw, to something persistent and machine actionable. And uh, CD concept has uh, elements for all of these things that we can we can use. Two minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Elvis will have specific roles, as I mentioned before, and some of these roles probably won't make sense of out, out of the Elvis and Disco context, uh, but we do need to uh, implement those, but uh, we can use the uh, the person information for that and we are promoting uh, and suggesting people to use orchid so we can get the name email affiliation and also create an expert profile for the collection name uh, as i said before we're still in the very beginning of thinking about this thing so we haven't gotten into the level of the hierarchy and the nested uh, relationship but we're looking into the name unit uh, of course if we can get a digital identifier tied to that description uh, that uh, would be making uh, life easier to connect different things and for that, uh, we will be thinking about the collection as a digital object. And tomorrow there's a talk uh, talking about these things uh, as well. So if you're interested, you can, you can join that. Um, so uh, the idea is the digital object will have the identifier and then the description will become a digital object uh, connected with uh, other elements. There are some legacy data that we have to deal with. Uh, this is coming from the CTAF uh, consortium. Uh, where some of our synthesis partners are coming from. Uh, they have a profile, uh, which is basically currently a, just a URL. And then there are summary information, what's, what's similar to description, but it's, it's not really structured. So we have to figure out how to, how to get, gather this information and, and, and map it into the standard way. So there's a total number of specimen features of the collections, a DNA bank, seed bank, and other things that basically uh, creates a profile for that institution. Some of the things that we are working on closely with CTEF and GBIF uh, to figure out this registry of collections, and you can see some of the progress that we talked about during the uh, world catalog consultations a few months ago. Uh, we're working on role management because that's important for the workflow. A transnational call, which is the, the physical access, that would be another component that will come in in Elvis. And of course, the current data uh, from CTEF and synthesis that we will be basically collecting and, and figure out how we can integrate that in standard format. And you can follow uh, in the GitHub page uh, to get see some more details. And if you're interested in submitting user stories, you can also do that uh, from that page. That's time. So to wrap it up, please. That's it. Uh, uh, so this is part of the Synthesis grant. And I also want to thank the Work Packet 6 members. And Picturei is the company that we're working with uh, for the development effort uh, of Elvis. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Sharif. Um, it's time for questions. Get those questions percolating. And don't be shy. Well, must be another talk that's just so good. All the questions are answered preemptively. All right, Debbie is asking, how will the dashboard work with GBIF? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a good question. So, so one thing we talked about during the world consultation is basically the data flow, how CTAF, Disco, and GBIF, you know, will work together. So that's probably will happen within that discussion. So in an ideal world, we would like to have basically a central way of doing things where we can plug into one one source and we can have multiple dashboards uh, 
So that will be sort of the alignment work we have to do with uh, the GBIF data with the CETAF organizations and, and have, have it uh, flow into Elvis. Thanks. We have one from Yorit. Uh, can talk a little about how Elvis records data pr provenance and transformations. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, so uh, in the digital object uh, talk tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit about that as well, but I can briefly talk about. So basically all of this transaction that we are thinking about, there they will be events. So we're also looking into the event-based design approach for our system. Uh, so, for example, somebody's uh, looking up an item, uh, that's an event, somebody's looking up uh, uh, requesting an item, that's also an event, so all of this event will go uh, some sort of an event log. Uh, so that's sort of the event part, and then we're also looking into the, the provenance uh, uh, model of uh, the metadata attribution as well. Thanks. We have another question from David. Uh saying, is there an accept, and sorry, is there an expectation that non-EU folk will use Elvis once operational to request their specimens for loans? Does that mean you'll need a global approach right out the gate? Um, yes, I think we, we have that vision, but at the moment, I think uh, we haven't really concentrated on that yet, but ideally, yes, we are looking into an open source tool uh, that uh, people can use. Uh, so, so that means that, you know, there has to be some core element that anybody can download and plug it in into their local system. Uh, uh, and in a way, I mean, we are, there are, there are 25, 21 institution in synthesis from different countries. So in a way we're already have some global element in it, but it needs to be a little bit wider uh, than, than the European uh, uh, focus at the moment. Uh, so yeah, there is a vision, but I think uh, uh, we need to work, clo look, look closely into it. Yeah. Maybe as another question, um, will you track requests denied for loans? Will you collect demographics, say countries asking for loans? Um, yes, I think the, the denied request definitely is one thing that has to be, uh, as an event has to be requested. And I think we have user stories for that too. Um, we will have institutional information uh, attached to the request. Um, uh, so, yeah, so, so I think in, in that level, I think we'll collect some demographics. Uh, so from, from that, we will get the information about the country. So, so that's one nice thing about the GREED or RAR identifier, uh, because the, the metadata of the institution uh, should be available uh, through the identifier there. Great, thanks. A uh, question from Sharon. Presumably the system will handle permits. Is there a data standard around that being thought about? Um, that's, I'm not familiar with that. So yeah, uh, I, I'm, are you specifically talking about, uh, access policies and. I was, yeah, I was thinking about, you know, uh, collecting permits and international agreements, MOUs, uh, because yeah. that goes down into Nagoya and that kind of stuff, right? Right, right. Yeah. So definitely Nagoya and ABS, we, we captured those in our, uh, um, user stories. Uh, so there's also a policy element. So that data definitely has to come from some source, either the institutions or central authority, but I'm not sure uh, at the moment if there's a standard uh, way to handle that. Uh, so yeah, no, that that part I don't know, but definitely we have the requirements captured that that needs to be in the request. So when, when a user requests an item, it should be able to capture the policy and permits that are attached to that, yeah. Thanks, and um, let's see, gotta scroll up a little bit. Uh, James is asking, what about other transactions like exchanges and gifts? Yes, uh, there are um, a few use cases that we, we came up with that, but at the moment, our primary focus is loans and visits. Uh, so that's where most of our efforts are, are uh, focused on. Um, but if we, think about the core element of the request, uh, it should be flexible enough to extend it depending on the need. Uh, so basically at, at the moment, we are looking into very basic elements of the request. Somebody requests an item, somebody requests a visit, somebody's requesting a, um, uh, to use an instrument. 
so theoretically, uh, it should be extendable to attach another type of request in that element. Uh, so we have that design view uh, from the beginning that we're not bound to certain type of requests. Uh, but primarily because of the focus of the Synthesis Plus project, uh, our primary concern is, is loans and visits. Thanks. All right, we have any more questions? There's still time. So if anyone has any more questions, we still have time to take them. We'll give people another 30 seconds or so. So if there's no more questions, we can move on. Another one from Debbie, are Elvis and CDD connected? Yeah, so CDD is the collection uh, dashboard. Um, yes, uh, they are collect, uh, uh, connected in a way. So Elvis will have a connection to the dashboard. Uh, Elvis will also have uh, sort of its own dashboard for Elvis specific things. Uh, so and, uh, uh, ideally, they will be probably pointing to the same collection uh, catalog. Uh, so is in, in, in that way, uh, they're collected. Yeah. Thanks. Another one from David. Will Elvis be centralized or distributed? In other words, would requests be sent directly to an appliance or software at each institution for local handling? Uh, yes. So I think it's a it's a very hybrid situation because uh, in Disco we will be working with 120 different museums. Uh, so some organizations will to will prefer centralized solutions, and then some of the smaller organization probably cannot. Uh, so we'll have to probably think about both of these uh, models. Uh, and then, yeah, so we are also working on a help desk model that will be tied with uh, Elvis and other services that are that are that will be coming online. And one element of that help desk will be how the request is handled. So different tiers of, of uh, uh, of uh, help desk uh, request handling will be in place. Uh, so that will be routed to each institution and basically you will identify different uh, roles in each institution for local handling, yeah. Great, thanks. And uh, Yort with a quite, oh, good question. How much does Elvis cost? Um, so if you're talking about the development and uh, other efforts, so that's coming from the synthesis grant, uh, but as a software, uh, as I said, this will be an open source uh, when we're, we're in a ready version to be released. Uh, so in that sense, you know, it's, it's probably free, but as you know, there's, there's nothing free. Uh, but yeah, at the moment, I don't, I, we're not planning Elvis as a, as a commercial or, or paid software. Yeah. So it will be more of a implementation cost. Yeah, so Elvis uh, development and maintain cost. Um, so yeah, I think that's a tricky question to answer at the moment because currently it, it, is it, it's happening within the Synthesis Plus project. Uh, so the, the way the funding is working, so that's where most of the development uh, effort is, is happening. Uh, and then, it will become a service within the Disco Consortium, which is still in the preparation phase. Uh, so Disco has to come up with a plan to continue that, that development effort and support effort. Uh, and then within the Disco Consortium, people will be able to use, use the service uh, as, as an as a, as a e-service for the Disco, yeah. So yeah, so I don't, I don't have that number, but uh, it's something to think about, yeah. Great, thanks. All right, any more questions? We got about a minute. I'm sorry if you hear my dog barking in the background, a car drove by. All right, if there's no more questions for now, um, we can move on to last but not least, we have Donald Hoburn. And Donald, you weren't here in the beginning, so if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself um, as uh, we had our speakers do introductions. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Somehow I got the uh, got myself an hour off here. Uh, so uh, I'm Donald Hoban, uh, formerly director of GBIF, currently based in Canberra in Australia and uh, working on various research infrastructure projects. Uh, what I wanted to speak about today was uh, the virtual conference we held earlier in the year, seems a very long time ago, and I apologize to those of you who are involved that we still haven't finalized uh, the report from it. 
Uh, what this was, was uh, an attempt to uh, bring together people from all over the world to play to take part in a discussion. And it was uh, just before COVID, just before everybody transitioned into doing so much on Zoom and other tools. Uh, and we were seeing it as a way to get more realistic about virtual collaboration. And that all seems uh, so old now. Uh, the Those listed on this first slide uh, were the uh, coordination team that uh, helped to run this activity. And I really want to acknowledge uh, their efforts uh, over that period. So as I've said, uh, this was uh, focused on being a low carbon consultation. Uh, the basic model was that we circulated an ideas paper, uh, a set of discussion topics, uh, introduced that in a couple of webinars, one in for uh, Eastern oriented uh, participants and one uh, further West. Uh, and then from that, we prepared various presentations and slides, including some from, from, from GBIF, Index Herbariorum, uh, Disco, etc. Uh, ran a consultation for a couple of weeks, during which the, uh, the coordinators monitored the discussion in the GBIF discourse forum uh, around a number of topics, uh, and uh, every day sent out a summary email of what the discussions had involved. Uh, and so what we have now is a set of pages in the GBIF discourse site that includes pretty thorough uh, capture of all of the points that were discussed and the various views that were represented. Uh, we also provided some support to, uh, to enable those who, for whom English was not their first language uh, to be able to participate uh, more easily. And uh, the goal here is to produce a white paper that uh, I must apologize, but still not having uh, helped to complete. The background to this is the fact that uh, quite clearly, as you've already been hearing over the last few presentations, there are a number of very significant and important activities going on globally that in different ways collect uh, information about collections uh, and organize it for different sub audiences. And uh, if each of these catalogues uh, had a completely discrete audience and there was never any need for anybody to search across them, that might be fine. Uh, but as things stand at the moment, there is a lot of duplication of effort in trying to maintain information. It's very easy for these records to go stale. Uh, and so there's a desire uh, to be better at uh, making good use of any effort that goes into contributing this information. And this includes uh, GR Cycle, which is now hosted by GBIF and is really the evolution of a previous effort within the Tadwig community to build a collection of, uh, a, a catalog of collections. Uh, you can see several of the others here and it doesn't represent the diversity of different kinds of information systems that are collecting this, including those for living collections, such as culture collections and botanic gardens, and those with a more regional focus rather than global. Uh, the ideas paper is available from the, the GBIF website. It's available in four languages uh, and really outlined the, the set of 22 topics we wanted to discuss. And all I'm going to do today, given there was so much information, is just highlight some of the key points that came out. And I think few of these are going to be total surprises, and a lot of them are going to reflect things that have already been talked about uh, today. So the, the first broad area for discussion was, was uses for the catalogue. And, and there was so much that was discussed here that not everything can be um, can be covered on a single slide and, and a, a minute or two like this. But there was, uh, these are some of the, the points that uh, even if identifiers are incorrect in some reason, there is real value in uh, a catalogue helping to bring these together, much much like uh, the, the catalogue of life helps us even with misspellings of names. Uh, obviously, one of the fundamental goals for bringing together all of this effort is to make it easier for taxonomists to locate and access materials. And uh, the points that Sharif just been making in his presentation are highly relevant there. Overall, uh, there was uh, a pretty strong theme of uh, a desire from collections and institutions around the world to use uh, something like a shared catalogue as a way to develop more of a sense of community to identify possible new co collaborations uh, and together to seek uh, the resources and funds they need. On the other hand, uh, there's, uh, there's a need for 
us to be good at uh, showing what is special and important about each collection. That this shouldn't be uh, just merely a set of thousands of relatively similar records. Uh, we need a system that will allow us to, uh, to plug in uh, some of that uh, individual branding and profiling. And through that, we'll be able to see more easily how collections complement one another uh, and do interesting uh, aggregation of information at regional levels. The second uh, broad area, which is uh, perhaps the most Tadwig relevant of all, were, was looking at the information in the catalog. And uh, there's so much that ha has been going on uh, here uh, in the collections descriptions group uh, that we didn't really dig into. We just, we just took that for granted. But overall, uh, there are three key questions that cataloging uh, collections seemed to need to address. First of all, making it easier for any researcher to find out what materials do exist in the world's collections. Uh, obviously, initially, not, not at full detail with full specimen records for every specimen, uh, but the ability to locate where uh, there is likely to be and ultimately where there are uh, suitable materials, and then how to uh, how to gain more information about them. So where the materials are held and how to access them being very critical needs for taxonomists and others. Uh, we we recognise that we don't just need to be looking at the uh, the current active collections. We also need to be thinking about historical collections. Uh, and uh, there was a, a lot of focus on the flexibility that is needed for bringing this together. And I'm sure again that this has been. Uh, discussed today. Starting with simple lists of collections from institutions may be a good starting point, but we need a lot of flexibility about what is considered a collection, and we need to move away from some of our tendency in the past, I think, to uh, to treat institutions, collections, and associated data sets as a kind of hierarchy. Uh, different profiles are needed for different sectors. Fish collections and moss collections are very different, uh, and there was a desire, uh, without becoming uh, bogged down in the technicalities, uh, for us to be able to meet the needs of Wikipedia so that any work that went into bringing together information on collections could feed into uh, these public information systems. Uh, some of the things, again, that have been talked about today um, have addressed the need for different types of pathways to get information together. We're not talking here about building something new. We're talking about aggregation of information from across uh, all of the different uh, existing catalogues such as Index Herbariorum, uh, but also finding new ways that make it easier for collections to manage their own data as Sharon uh, was discussing, uh, easier or not, I don't know, but certainly uh, making use of all the efforts everywhere to do so. Uh, and that could include, for example, uh, better interfacing directly with collection management systems as one of the sources for this information. Uh, we need, thanks very much. Uh, we need to be able to to deal with uh, a roles-based approach, not simply uh, systems or users. Uh, and uh, it's important uh, for us to have a sensible approach to interpreting and validating at least the most fundamental metadata elements. A lot of the use of uh, any system like this is to get information in front of humans' eyes uh, and allow them to see what they need. But uh, as uh, Sharif was discussing, there's also a lot that can be automated or uh, interpreted uh, to provide more standard information products. And we need to be thinking about those. And lastly, um, but perhaps most importantly, because uh, the technical side is not necessarily difficult, the real challenges here are around uh, the human networking and collaboration and making sure that this is useful, accepted and trusted by people all over the world. Uh, collections themselves need to be very much in control. Uh, we need to be providing tools and documentation from the Tadwig level through to uh, information on how to access services that are really easy for the full range of stakeholders within collections. Uh, and uh, we, we also need to be thinking very carefully about how to make something like this a truly global effort. Uh, we have certain regions which are relatively well resourced. We have institutions that are better resourced than others. And we need to find ways to partner around maintaining information systems that showcase uh, all of the efforts of all of the collections. Uh, GBIF and CTAF um, have already been mentioned here uh, and there are other parties around the world. That, uh, GBIF and CTAF were particularly flagged as potentially core to the long-term maintenance of a system like this, but we do need to be thinking about 
how to maintain information systems uh, for multiple decades. And if anybody wants to, to find out more uh, prior to the final report being prepared, um, I would encourage you to visit the GBIF discourse site. Uh, and this page is the, the route from which all of the other information is, uh, is hanging off. Thank you. Perfect, right on time. All right, thanks so much, Donald. Thank you. All right, time for questions. Give people some time, let the questions start bubbling. Today's talks are just so good and all the questions are answered before. All right, Debbie, she's asking, what was most surprising or striking so far about community input? I think, um, I think there, were, there were relatively few surprises. This is a topic which, as you know, has been discussed on many occasions. Uh, the goal here was really to cast a wide net and make it as easy as possible for uh, even those who couldn't travel to a, a central workshop or who didn't have the resources to be able to provide inputs. Uh, we did uh, put quite a bit of effort, and I really want to thank the, the translators and the, uh, the language coordinators for their efforts in supporting uh, particularly Spanish and Chinese, but, uh, but also French uh, for the consultation. And it, it was striking that uh, perhaps because we were doing this written rather than uh, verbally, uh, orally, uh, we didn't receive very many separate uh, comments uh, in in other languages. Uh, so, I, I I think the the real interest to me uh, was the the range of countries and individuals who were interested. Uh, but uh, I don't think we, we we discovered anything radically new. It was just a good chance to consolidate and make sure that those views were widely held. Great, thanks. And a question from Paula. Now that we have learned more about doing virtual consultations, what would you do differently? I would set aside more time for writing up the report at the end because we have a lot, <laughs> a lot of information. And in some ways it's, it's harder to have such thorough capture of all of the comments uh, that, that people made since everything was written down. Um, and uh, trying to organize that into a sensible uh, sized report can be a little bit difficult, but there is there's a great deal there that I think is uh, is really interesting. Uh, I personally, if if anybody is thinking about a virtual consultation that doesn't involve people having to jump in at a particular time of day uh, to join a session uh, and potentially get their 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 clocks wrong as I did this morning. Um, then uh, I think the model we were we were using was a good one. It takes quite a bit of effort, but it does mean that if somebody's got half an hour in their day at any point that they want to monitor a discussion and contribute, they have the opportunity to do so and really be part of the discussion. Uh, in a world in which we're not seeing so much of each other face to face, uh, spending a lot more time in a discussion forum may not be the, the most stimulating use of time, uh, but it seems to work. Great, thanks. All right, then Guido is asking, he's asking to all speakers, and we do have an open forum after this Q&A session, so and Donald, you can answer this first. Um, he's asking, what common denominator do you see between the ongoing efforts? So what amount of overlap and maybe which opportunities for extending based upon experiences from the related efforts? I, I think the, the most significant key commonality is that there's, there's there's a good understanding that what we're doing here is a join between relatively simple, uh, or that there are real choices on the technologies and the data standards, but the real challenge is making this so that it works efficiently and easily for collection managers and other contributors. Uh, and that for us to do that, we've got to understand the, the range of needs and flexibility of those stakeholders and make it as easy as possible for them to do something once and for us all to be able to benefit 
uh, from those efforts. So uh, I, I, I do think that orchids as identifiers for humans are really uh, an excellent example of, of what we would like to be able to see, that we have an anchor point against which all kinds of information can be attached and where it's not so difficult to plug together different services that use the ORCID as the access point. And I think in a sense, we need to be doing something similar where the, the information that is specific to herbaria can be coming to that kind of system through Index Herbariorum. Uh, information about published specimen records can be coming through GBIF uh, and, and other sources can be attaching information. How we then organize it so that it's efficient for people to read is an, or access or search is another issue, but uh, we've got to be uh, as, as flexible as possible. Great, thanks. And again, the question was directed to all the speakers, but in the, for the sake of fairness, um, let's get through the rest of the question specifically for Donald so the other speakers can sort of formulate how they'd like to answer Guido's question there. Um, so we have a question, another one um, from Eli, saying taxonomists slash researchers want to know what material exists, where and how to access them, but senior executives want metrics to report on. Will this tension be addressed in the report? Um. I yes, I think it, I think it will to some extent. To the, uh, in in as far as it, it can be resolved, uh, the what what I think we need to be thinking about doing uh, in order to support taxonomy and the importance of collections is making it easier for the significance of the collections themselves and their specimens and the materials that taxonomists need to be to access to be something around which the institution can feel proud, feel it has real branding, and where it's possible, for example, in its, in its corporate or annual reports, to be able to show just how visible and valuable the collection is. Uh, and if we are putting together the information from all these different sources in a way that does uh, have a, a good showcase front end, uh, for information about the site and produces metrics on visits and uses it's, and, and uniqueness, for example, then I think we're helping both sides of that equation. Thanks. All right, another one from Debbie. Uh, what about the Envision workflow for these data? I, I would say that uh, one of, it probably wasn't the most efficient conversation we were having to get into the, the detailed workflow. And I think we we recognized that uh, on a one level, uh, you know, that all of the work in Tadwig with collection descriptions was handling the uh, the data representation side of this. Uh, we we already also had a great deal going on, um, not just in uh, Synthesis Plus slash Disco and in GBIF, on uh, looking at ways to handle this and thinking about the visualization and the processing. So uh, I, I really think that this particular discussion was more about making sure that the, the views of the community on what they needed uh, were presented rather than working out those details. Great, thanks. We have another question from Paula. Uh, so once the report is out, which are concrete steps that we, the community, should be taking to turn these conclusions into tangible progress and or products? I, okay, I've, I've got a bit of a vested interest here because, um, you know, background in GBIF and all that. And uh, I, I do see that uh, the, al although GR cycle is something much, much simpler and uh, less, I suppose, less clean in some ways than some of the other uh, efforts we have globally, the, the fact that it is now uh, aligned with the work that GBIF is doing to uh, catalog specimen data uh, and allows it to serve as, uh, I hope, something into which we can involve using that, uh, that global anchor point model that I was, I was talking about, because it spans everything. It doesn't have to solve all the problems. Uh, hopefully, uh, Disco and Elvis are going to solve many of them for the European collections and, and develop processes that can go more widely. Index Herbariorum has already solved many of the issues for the, the herbarium community. Uh, IDIGBio and ALA and others are also um, clearly all active. What, what we need, I think, is to uh, to spend some time just working out how to pull together 
uh, links and uh, and information from all of these different sources against those anchor points and then carry on working through the uh, some of the standardization and normalization activities that uh, that Tadwig uh, I think particularly can contribute to. Great, thank you. And uh, so it's it's 5:40 at least my time. Um, so now it's time for discussion. Um, so our session does go on until um, let's see what is it in UTC uh, 2200 UTC. So the remaining time is sort of an open forum. Um, you know, if you have questions for any of the speakers or all of the speakers, like Guido's question above, and I suppose we can start with that. Um, if any of our other speakers would like to to answer his question, which let me scroll back up. So again, what common denominator do you see between the ongoing efforts? What amount of overlap and maybe which opportunities for extending based upon experiences from the related efforts? And this is to all speakers. So if the rest of our speakers would like to speak up and I see Sharon answered in the chat, but maybe Sharon, you'd want to answer with, with your voice. And so this is sort of an open forum. Sure, I can, I can take a quick shot and read what I've said and see what people think. So I guess for me, um, <clears throat> one of the things we've struck, well, we spent a little while discussing is where is the line between what the standard should do and what the platform that an aggregator or uh, someone who's you know, interested in metrics or whatever they're interested, in, what they should be doing. And you know, there's the line in the sand that says the standard needs to be able to handle the data, but it doesn't dictate what is and isn't done with the data. Um, that said though, I think one of the critical pieces for the standard, standard is in terms of handling duplication is how it um, deals with identifiers, because that's where, you know, it, it's going to be, the, the rubber really hits the road and we already have lots of implementations of descriptions and there are many identifiers out there. So, so I think it's incumbent upon the standards group to make sure that identifiers are handled well, so that at the aggregator level and at the dashboard builder level, there's, there's an ability to disambiguate at the different levels. I don't know if that helps answer the question, Guido. If that's not what you were asking, I apologize. <laughs> All right, any of our other speakers wanna take a stab at that question? I'll paste it again um, in the chat. So I'm not repeating myself a thousand times. Um, I can have a bash as well. Um, I, I mean, simply, I think there's a very strong common, common denominator in that the more you look at them, the more they seem to be, they're variants of the same theme. So they've got, um, you know, different, um, is, it's quite a big overlapping Venn diagram, but they, they might have different domains in terms of the geographic coverage of the institutions um, and the level of granularity that they're looking at. But ultimately, I think that it's, it's a, I guess it's a bit like um, describing specimens before Darwin Core or ABCD was defined. I think collection um, metadata is just behind in that sense, but there's actually that that time the um, well the opportunity now to move towards using those common terms, using common control vocabularies, um, and then you can see it being just an ecosystem that um, that that joins strongly together. I think um, uh, probably some of the biggest barriers to it are on the government side of government side of things to work out who is controlling what data, who has ownership of what data, who feels like they have ownership of that data. There's probably less of, there's more of a challenge in that than there probably is in the technical side of joining this up. And we can also use all the advances on specimen data, like in the persistent identifiers, um, like looking at digital objects that are happening that we can piggyback that on the collection side to actually move this more into a kind of more machine readable um, better organized data set, but the, the government side is quite critical. Yeah, I will also second the, the points about the identifiers. So I think uh, it is correct that we are already using lots of different identifiers, but I think there's some global conversations going on in other domains as well uh, for identifier interoperability. Uh, so even though the idea of persistency and uh, uh, global sort of 
sometimes it's hard to define those things, but I think there are some agreements, people defining that, okay, as long as you feel this criteria is, you know, you can use different identifier systems, but make sure that it, it, it for your use case, it, it provides that this requirement. So persistency probably will come from the organization and the policies behind it. It's not just a technical solution. Uh, so similarly, other aspect of identifiers uh, has to be thought about in, in different contexts. Uh, so in that way, multiple identifier system is a reality, but I think what we should think about is the, is the interoperability of, of those identifier system that, that, that we can use. And I think uh, anchoring that identifier with an object helps us to, to visualize uh, what, what that could be. Yeah. Thanks guys. And Martin, if you're still around, if you wanna take a stab at this question, um, but I imagine considering the news in his life, he might be busy or asleep. <laughs> If I, if I can just add one point to, to what Matt said, I, I do think that uh, pretty much all of the, the problems we've discussed over the years in Tadwig are really the same problem, just a, for subtly different types of data. Uh, we're dealing over and over again with things where for decades people have had semi-formal ways of referring to them, whether it's scientific names in checklists, whether it's specimen identifiers, whether it's collection identifiers. Uh, and our real challenge is transferring these long and relatively successful legacy ways of referring to things that researchers need to know about into the digital space. So we, we can learn from Darwin Core for this uh, and uh, reapply, I think, many of the same things that we've learned there. All right, thanks everyone. And it looks like we have a question from David. I expect there's considerable malaise and disillusionment in part of collections managers and efforts. What do we do to put their minds at ease and also convince managers, institutions to add the maintenance of metadata to staff job descriptions and duties? So if anyone wants to take a crack at that. I'll, sure. I'll take this. Oh, go, oh, go ahead, Donald. Go. I'll follow up behind you. Really? Okay. Um, yeah, no, it's it's it is an excellent question. Um, I think it is the reality of being part of an international community where we don't have global funding that pays for everything. We really do have to work in a piecemeal fashion, and it can be very confusing. And part of what we need to be doing, I think, is is getting better at explaining the wh whether there are distinctives for each of the things we're doing, but also how they are committed to fitting together as, as part of a bigger picture. So the whole allow, alliance for uh, biodiversity knowledge thing, uh, I think is an important principle. But uh, I, I, I would say that the, the, the part about getting, getting this to be part of people's job descriptions, we need to get to the point where there's real benefit to the institutions in having their information in a clear public space uh, that people, people find today. Um, yeah, it seems almost well. It, it seems more and more inconceivable that people wouldn't go and get themselves an orchid ID and start tracking their their publications, etc. That way, uh, we need to get to the point where we are offering similar levels of value for institutions to be able um, to to have standardised ways of representing their holdings and to build additional services of it. So something like like Elvis would obviously be uh, enormous um, if the, the key way that institutions were sharing information was through uh, largely digitally enabled uh, communications, uh, the absence of uh, any particular collection from a system like that would be quite serious and it would be a major incentive to institutions to encourage their staff to create the metadata. Yeah, I guess on the from from our point of view, sitting on the museum side, it's got to be easy, and it's we've got to do it once. That's that's the key to all of this. Is um, whatever systems are out there, I want to be able to just document it once and then build on it. And Matt kind of made that point in one of his slides early on. And I think as a group, we had to kind of realize that 
the the standard that was then going to be used by you know folios making your great um, visualization systems had to be um, extendable you couldn't you can't expect people to do it once come back do it again so we have to work out what is the core the the, the what is the essence of the standard and then the modeling pieces can build up on that because the idea is that um, we don't have time to do it over and over again but also there's a reciprocal you know on the researcher end in in terms of funding some of those collections people as part of your project to do some of this work because you know you need the metrics but that's how you get an institution to say oh yeah i'll free up this person to do this is thinking of that documentation as part of your research project because that frees up the person in, if it's just one person in a museum, it frees them up, gives them some kind of incentive. Yeah, it's great. We, we all need publication incentive, but we need to be paid as well. Um, we, there's only so much you can do on cans of beans. Well, I guess that's what I would say is help pay some of the collections people to, to create these descriptions in the way that you, in the detail that you need them. I think there's also a point about um, building on providing the right tools to make it easy for collections staff um, to start creating providing this data both internally within their institutions and also when providing it to external platforms and see one key part of that is how it works with um, uh, tools like the IPT or the Bycase provider software but also the collections management system part is a really important part of it going forwards because if you can build in this kind of structure as a as something which um, digitized specimens can hang off so people can organize their collections easily within their cms as well as just organizing their specimens um, then that's when you can start to actually push that towards being useful business as usual um, uh, databasing activity in the same way that um, databasing a specimen is at the moment, even though there are still you know, some hurdles to overcome in some places to um, to really make that uh, embedded as business as usual. But I think that's an important part of uh, making this easier and less painful. Ellie had a, a point in there that I kind of would connect up with what Matt just said. Um, on that more cultural collection side, the non-traditionally natural history collection side, um, those collections generally are, uh, have a really good accession um, kind of ethos. And so actually a lot of these kind of um, higher level descriptions of batches of things that come in, we could learn very much from the way that that's handled with the cultural collections, because that's, that's probably one of the first most detailed descriptions you have of, of objects and specimens coming in. They have to be accessioned. So working with that part of your your institution, the people who are handling the, the legal, okay, well, I have it, it came in. Um, those are often, you know, nice potted descriptions of collections and increasingly they're digital too. So part of the standard has been on our side, certainly keeping that in mind and making sure that there are enough hooks. And I think we, we, we can see that it's possible um, to document at that level, which then lets the cultural collections be able to do that, probably in a way that the natural history people are gonna to have to catch up to, but it's doable. You have something to say, Debbie? I see you unmuted yourself. Well, I was decided to type it instead, but um, I'm, I'm interested in the question that um, Quentin asked earlier or asking for input from the smaller collections that are here. And it, it ties together with this notion of what's easy to provide, how hard is it, do we have the sort of integrated systems that Matt and Sharon and Donald, et cetera, were alluding to? Um, because I was thinking about things like finding and sharing duplicate data. It's not just about um, Exacati or herbarium sheets that could be duplicate, right? but we have people duplicate data and we have locality duplicate data and we have parts of whole collections that have been divided up across collections. So if, for example, the small collections here, how are there anybody here willing to speak up from a small collection? What do you need 
from a system like this? What are your thoughts? Anybody brave enough? <laughs> you can turn your own mics on. Um, yeah, this is an open forum. So, you know, anyone, uh, regardless if you're, you're a speaker or not, you can turn your mics on, turn your cameras on, you know, we're all friends here. So speak up. All right, this is your opportunity. So let's put it this way. Can you all imagine sharing your um, people information? I see James, James Macklin, you have your hand up. I do, but I don't represent a small collection. <laughs> I was waiting and pausing with everybody else. I think I, I have a comment though that relates to all. Uh, and, and I've sort of put it in the chat already, but there's, there's lots of things spinning around and it, and it seems to be, you know, how do we incentivize senior administration to let us just do what we want to do uh, and, and to make this possible. And, you know, having been a senior administrator and hung out with senior administrators, you sort of get to, you know, the harsh reality of, well, it's pretty much all about money uh, and somewhat about reputation and recognition. Uh, and so you have to work with those things and find a positive way to impact those people. And, and I think we have more than enough positive ways to do that. Uh, and, you know, some of it is if you don't, you know, if you're a store and, and you have, you know, black sheeting in front of your windows and no one can see in it, it's hard to know whether you should go in that store and most people will walk by. But if you have a store that has lots of great and interesting stuff in the windows that intrigues you or that you think, hey, I really need that thing that's right there, there it is, and I'm gonna pay money for it. Well, if we can create these positive feedback loops where everybody knows to some granularity what you have, all you might be able to say is, I have 27 animals. Well, to someone that might be exciting. They might wonder what animal you have, who knows? But all I'm saying is that if you don't put your clothes out, if you don't show people what you have, then they can't possibly be interested in it. And if they are interested in it, many researchers are looking for those key specimens that they cannot find. If they know you have it, they may well pay you to digitize it. They have a big international project. They've got $5 here or there. That gives reputation and that gives money to the big or the small, doesn't matter. And if we can build these little iterative loops through discovery and discovery leading to need and to want from research, I mean, I think, I don't think it's that hard. Yes, we struggle a bit with the standards. We struggle a bit with implementation of simple tools, but the story is there. I think we can do that. Thank you. And Talia, I see you have your hand up. I do. Um, I don't know that I'm from a small collection. I'm from a maybe medium to small sized university collection, but I work with a lot of small collections. And I think one of the things that has to happen is there has to be outreach. Um, and you have to let people know that this is happening and how to participate. Um, and so I think that's a big part of it is reaching out to those collections, um, you know, holding workshops, you know, whatever you can do to help them um, along the way. Thanks, Talia. Yorit, I see you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I have, I'm not from a small collection, but I'm, uh, I'm an independent uh, software developer. And from that perspective, I know that it is uh, very hard to participate in uh, the conversations that were uh, shared uh, today, simply because I don't have the resources or the time to sit in every single meeting. And um, so I imagine that for small collections, it's the same problem, right? They probably can't even afford to be at this meeting to talk about it. So that's one thing. And the other thing, from a little bit more of a technical uh, uh, point of view, in my experience, the, the way information systems are, are, are architected are intrinsically uh, political, yeah? And they are... Uh, architected from a perspective of the people that built them and um, that's how they see the world. So I would also try to open up the, the uh, 
uh, I would want to see a discussion about uh, the information systems and the architectures that are being proposed and how, yeah, who builds them and who gets to have a seat at the table. Because I think that, uh, you know, we can all make very nice uh, PowerPoint slides and come up with like very, very cool ideas. But if not, everybody gets to participate from the beginning, then um, yeah, because it's, it's more like a, take it or leave it kind of situation. And there's, yeah. So that's, these thoughts came up as, as uh, that was uh, asking a question. All right, thanks so much. And it's the top of the hour. And I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. And we sure we all have Zoom fatigue already, no matter where you are in the world. Um, so thanks everyone so much. Thanks to our speakers for some really great talks. Thanks to uh, everyone who's attended with your awesome questions. And uh, just you know, a big thank you to everyone.